um, uh, give you an overview of uh, leasing um, as, uh, uh, as a whole. And we're going to break that up into uh, a number of different components, partly so that you get to hear from everybody in the room uh, and, um, uh, and, 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 and partly to try and give you a sense of the shape of the aircraft lease. And so uh, we'll talk in a minute about why uh, one might lease aircraft. Uh, we'll have a look at the duration and some of the key uh, terms of, of leasing. And we'll have a look at what happens once the aircraft is entered into the lease. So the delivery of the aircraft, the re-delivery at the end, and what happens in the, in, in the intervening time, the operation, the maintenance and insurance. We'll have a look at trading transfers. Uh, the ability to move aircraft around between lessors is something that's become increasingly pertinent. And we'll have a look at the additional lease documents as well, because the lease is what sits very much at the centre of a leasing transaction, but is really only the primary document and is, is not something that exists in and of itself. We'll mention enforcement. It's important. It's topical. And I think it's fair to say that by volume, we are the, the number one practice globally for uh, aviation work in the private equity sector. And uh, so we have probably a... Uh, an unusually extensive amount of experience of, uh, of enforcement from uh, both sides of the table. And we'll finish up with a, with a brief look at uh, leasing and finance, uh, financing context, before uh, we also give an opportunity for questions. And I've told that the questions will all be very challenging and very difficult. So I'm thoroughly looking forward to my uh, examination at the, end of, uh, at the end of the session. Uh, so, without further ado, um, why lease? And uh, I think the important point to, uh, to understand um, is, is really what is a lease? And there are really many different definitions of what, uh, what a lease is, and there isn't a single um, accepted definition as a matter of English law or as a matter of New York law or, or, or Irish law. But really, the, uh, the best definition, in my view, is, is taken from the Cape Town Convention, which is uh, an international treaty that governs security interests over aircraft and aircraft objects. And the Cape Town Convention talks about one party, the lessor, granting rights over an object in return for rental or, or some sort of other payment to another party, the lessee. And I think in, uh, if you're looking for a succinct definition, to my mind, that is, the, that, that is the most apt definition to use. There are others. And um, for those of you who enjoy reading case law, I would uh, commend the case of celestial aviation trading to you. You can uh, enjoy uh, Justice Hamblin's comments at your leisure. They're rather extensive and they go into some of the intricacies of, of what is leasing. But that is essentially... The, the nature of a lease. Now, when you break that down further, there are, there are various uh, different types of lease. And really the way that we principally categorize it for these purposes, we'll look at a little bit later at financing leases and operating leases, but really for these purposes, and, and as to why a party would lease an aircraft, the important point, the, one, the important distinction is whether the lease is a dry lease or a wet lease. And simplistically, the way I always think of this is that your dry lease is akin to your rental car and your wet lease is akin to your taxi cab. Now, this is a, this is a simile that has some limitations and we'll discuss those in a minute. But, but the dry lease is, is, a, is a lease for what we call a naked aircraft. It is for the metal. It doesn't come with anything else. And the lessee will assume the operational responsibility, uh, will assume the responsibility for maintenance, for crewing, uh, for insurance. Now, that's important. The term is, is usually longer, I think probably at least two years. That's important because if you want to lease on a dry lease basis, then you need to have a longer term plan. You need to have a purpose for an aircraft for a period of two years or more, that would be a relatively short dry lease. And you need to have the infrastructure around it to, uh, to enable you to, uh, to operate that aircraft. 
In contrast, a wet lease, as I say, is a little bit more akin to a taxi. A wet lease uh, will usually be provided um, with not only the aircraft, but also with the crew, with the maintenance, and with the insurance. So you'll sometimes hear a wet lease referred to as uh, an ACME lease, uh, being the acronym for aircraft, crew, maintenance, and insurance. Now, where my uh, simile sort of runs out is that lessees will typically be responsible for fueling uh, the aircraft under a wet lease and for landing charges. So clearly, uh, at least in my experience, I've never been asked to uh, put any gas in the tank of a taxi driver, and I hope that doesn't happen, uh, because I suspect my skill set is not best suited to doing that. But um, that is essentially what a wet lease is. Now, why would you wet lease an aircraft? Well, we've seen some really interesting examples recently, usually for seasonal extra lift capacity. So uh, if you have a high season in one part of the world, you might bring an aircraft in on a short-term basis from another part of the world that is currently in a low season. Uh, we saw a lot of wet leasing during the uh, COVID, sort of uh, the worst of the COVID situation, when the so-called belly cargo capacity, so the cargo capacity under your feet uh, on aircraft was obviously taken out of um, the, the global cargo freight system because passenger aircraft weren't flying. So uh, freighters were being wet leased to provide uh, extra short-term lift. And the other reason we see wet leasing um, is very topical. Russia, Belarus, uh, other nations have been uh, on the tip of our tongue in relation to sanctions. And there are certain operators, particularly in the Middle East, where uh, for, for historical reasons, it is, it is very difficult to operate an aircraft into, into certain jurisdictions if they are registered in certain other jurisdictions. So wet leasing provides, um, in that sense, a certain operational flexibility. Um, looking at it, I suppose, from a slightly uh, broader perspective, really, uh, why lease? Well, the, you know, the fundamentals of, of leasing for uh, a lessee, whether it's a wet lease or a dry lease, are very much around not taking a, a capital intensive uh, asset into their business. It enables a, uh, the cost of acquisition, let's call it, to be defrayed over the period of that lease term. You pay for the uh, aircraft essentially over its life. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the context of operating and finance leases later on. Uh, and um, also, it gives a certain flexibility to airlines. The lessors will go and invariably sign up large purchase contracts some significant period of time into the future. And, uh, you know, at this stage, one doesn't know whether an aircraft type is going to be uh, popular. And uh, it also doesn't know whether the price is going to be favorable. And by popular, I don't just mean uh, aesthetically desirable. I mean, will there be wide, widespread support for a particular type of aircraft? And so for an airline operating a relatively small fleet in particular, uh, there is a clear competitive uh, strategic advantage to, to leasing and having that sort of nimble, flexible business model. So I think I'll leave that there. And um, let's delve a little bit more into some of the actual terms and uh, key provisions of the lease. And I'll hand over to uh, to my colleague Andrew to walk you through some of those. Thank you, Richard. So in terms of sort of the key financial terms that may come up in uh, operating leases generally, we sort of categorise these as, as follows. Um, I suppose sort of taking a step back in sort of the wider context, aircraft are often financed, and so financiers will often look at the terms of a lease and consider its bankability. So these will often be very key criteria that they will look at when sort of analysing the leases for the purposes of the financing. So, so sort of turning to the, uh, the term of the lease, um, this can vary. We have seen between five and 12 years. Of late, I would probably say it's between the 10 to 12 year mark, but it will depend on where the aircraft is in its life cycle. The end of the lease is often coordinated to, to coincide with a maintenance event. And ordinarily, um, it would be rare to find a voluntary termination option for the lessee in that lease, but early termination is considered in certain scenarios. So, for example, if there's ever a total loss in respect to the aircraft, 
if there's ever an illegality event which might impact upon the ability of the lessor or the lessee to comply with its obligations under the lease, or I guess more commonly, if there is an event of default um, by the lessee under the lease. So turning to the security deposit, um, this is effectively, it's arguably a bit of a misnomer under English law when we talk of it as security because it's designed effectively to be the unconditional property of the lessor once it is paid, they are then free to commingle it with their other assets. And what you then have at the end of the term in certain scenarios is a corresponding refund obligation upon the lessor to return an, an equivalent amount back to the lessee. Um, and the nature of the security deposit, this can either be cash or a letter of credit covering anywhere between a month to three months rent, potentially depending on the, the commercial terms. Um, in terms of the, the basic rent itself that's payable during the course of the, the lease, um, this is ordinarily payable monthly in advance. It can also take other forms, can be quarterly. From a financier's perspective, they would want to make sure that there is a regular flow of payments to sort of match any corresponding loan terms. So, for example, they wouldn't want to see any sort of lump upfront, uh, upfront payments being made. In terms of the nature of the rent, it can take either a fixed or floating format uh, with LIBOR changes, of course. That used to be the, the reference point. Well, they'll have to sort of be updated to reflect um, changes in risk-free rates that are sort of commonly used in the market now. Um, and if, a, if you do have a fixed rate lease, that has potential implications for a, a financing as well in terms of any mismatch between that fixed rate coming from the, the lessee and then any floating uh, interest rate obligations of the lessor or borrower under its financing. So there may need to be sort of hedging uh, arrangements put in place to, to counter that. Perhaps more of a creature of the pandemic, I would say, is uh, a tendency towards power by the hour payments uh, when so many aircraft have been grounded over the past couple of years. There's been a tendency to perhaps sweeten the deal with certain airlines to, to keep them on lease to sort of change the parameters of the rental payments so that it's effectively dictated by the usage of the aircraft by that lessee uh, and what's called sort of these power by the hour terms. And sort of touching on two sort of ancillary corollary points to sort of the, 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 the rent, there is of course withholding tax uh, issues uh, that do crop up and, and it's especially a key concern for Indian airlines I've, I've encountered in the past. So effectively, when, say, uh, an airline in India pays to a lessor in Ireland, say, there could be a withholding tax implication. If that were to arise, there would then be a contractual obligation upon the lessee to, to gross up its payment to that lessor. So what is often done then is to sort of try and structure the leases so that you are taking advantage of double taxation treaties between uh, two different countries. So I think actually between um, India and Ireland, I think there is a, a favourable double taxation treaty in place, which does sort of minimise, if not completely eliminate, uh, any withholding tax concerns that might arise. And Helen High Water um, is again sort of a, a term of a lease which sort of goes to the, its, its, its core bankability, I would say. Uh, this is effectively an obligation upon the airline to, to pay in all circumstances, come what may. So even if there's been a total loss of the aircraft, they're still under an obligation to pay rent until the total loss payment has been made to the lessor. Um, and this is to sort of to make sure that there is a regular and uh, almost irrevocable flow of uh, going to the lessor. <clears throat> so looking to, to maintenance, uh, which is another sort of key financial area, um, the operation of an aircraft brings with it certain uh, significant and expensive maintenance events uh, during its lifetime. Broadly, these are sort of categorized uh, in terms of sort of airframe checks, uh, auxiliary uh, power unit uh, overhauls, landing gear overhauls. And with respect to the engines, you have a performance restoration and also the sort of life limited parts that are installed on the engines will need to be replaced over the, the life cycle of the aircraft. So this can be quite a significant financial exposure, which can be dealt with in two ways. One is to 
uh, effectively have a regular payment of maintenance reserves, which are payable monthly during the lease term and assessed by reference to the usage of the aircraft over that period. Similar to the um, security deposit, this would be expressed to become the unconditional uh, and absolute property of the lessor, or that they're then free to commingle. Um, this again can be done either by way of cash or a letter of credit, which is put up as security. And I guess one sort of interesting point that might arise with maintenance reserves is increasingly airlines might have a total care arrangement in terms of its engines with uh, a manufacturer such as Rolls-Royce. And as a consequence, because they're effectively paying into their separate pot with Rolls-Royce, uh, they would want to have their maintenance reserve obligations suspended during that time, which can then bring with it its own sort of implications for a lessor and financier, that they would want to have the ability to get access to that pot of cash whilst the maintenance reserves are suspended. So there can be sort of quite lengthy and difficult discussions, tripartite discussions between the airline, the relevant manufacturer and the lessor, and actually potentially even the financier putting in those arrangements. And so the alternative to maintenance reserves, um, which perhaps might be reserved for sort of better credit airlines, is, a, is an end of lease compensation. It's payable at the end of the term. So once the aircraft is at re-delivery, and that would be calculated by reference, again, to the usage of the aircraft, but unlike maintenance reserves, which are sort of done on a monthly basis, this would be looking back over the period of the use of the aircraft, uh, either from delivery or from its most uh, recent maintenance event. So I think that sort of brings me uh, to Ash, uh, Ashley covering uh, delivery and delivery. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so these sound like very simple stages. It sounds like, you know, you, you meet at the airport and you hand over the keys, but actually the delivery and the redelivery processes are, are critically important in the in the leasing process for both sides of, uh, um, of, the, of the lease. Um, it can require very, very detailed choreography as well. There will often be a specific time window for the delivery um, starting at the beginning of the lease, and that can be subject to the delivery of the aircraft by the seller or the manufacturer to the owner, or the re-delivery to the owner of, um, of the aircraft by the previous lessee. Uh, this can be quite tricky to organise, but the lessor will need to ensure that re-delivery under one lease or delivery from the, from the seller and delivery under the next line up to avoid having the aircraft on their insurance for even as short a shorter period as overnight. Um, lessors will work very, very hard to avoid taking on that risk for even very short periods of time. Um, if for some reason there is a delay in the agreed um, delivery period for the aircraft, there might be a grace period, there might not be. Um, depending on the circumstances of the um, incoming lease incoming lessee um, there might be a termination right agreed if the delay goes on for too long there might be liquidated damages agreed or, or discounts to the rent um, that will depend on on the situation of the parties and whether or not the lease then goes ahead after that delay um, the acceptance certificate this is a, a very very important piece of the puzzle in um, aircraft leasing it's often just a, a single page document, uh, but it can be subject to a surprising amount of negotiation and even litigation if things don't go well. Um, a lessor will want a clean acceptance certificate, clean as far as possible where the lessee very clearly states they've accepted the aircraft in the condition that it's in. Um, and the lessee will want any discrepancies in the condition of the aircraft from the agreed condition of the aircraft to be itemized in that certificate and either resolved or compensated for. Um, some leases, of course, have as is where is, is their delivery condition. So it might be, be slightly different there, but no matter what, the parties will want to be very, very clear about what's in their acceptance certificate and that that is signed and delivered appropriately um, at the right time. Um, then looking to the end of the lease period for re-delivery of the aircraft, it's similar process in reverse. There will be an agreed uh, re-delivery condition um, set out in the lease or as is where is, depending on um, what the parties have agreed. If the lessee fails to comply with the re-delivery condition, uh, there can be financial consequences to that. And that will probably be because the lessor has lined up either a, a follow-on lease 
uh, or a sale of the aircraft and they will have obligations that they need to meet under either that sale agreement or that lease agreement. If the outgoing lessee doesn't meet their obligations in terms of the redelivery condition, that will prevent the lessor then being able to meet their obligations under the next arrangement. Um, so there might be an ability agreed for the lessor to, to claim as a debt or to claim any amounts of, uh, of cash that it might be holding under the very range, various arrangements that Andrew spoke about. There might be a letter of credit they can claim under or amounts of the maintenance reserves that they can hold on to. Um, so that there, there should be some options agreed there in the lease. Um, and the lessor may, not always, but may have provisions um, that allow them to force the redelivery of the aircraft. Again, if they are under an obligation to sell the aircraft on by a certain time, for example, um, again, with the appropriate compensation where this means that uh, their obligations under the follow-on arrangement are affected. So assuming the delivery goes ahead to plan, during the term of the lease, there will be various conditions um, to do with the operation of the aircraft that the lessee will have to work to. Uh, various parameters will be in place, some of them commercial and some of them legal. Um, for example, they will be required to operate the aircraft within the bounds of the insurance policy to which the aircraft is subject. Uh, they, will have to, they will have to comply with any applicable sanctions laws. Um, there might be a requirement not to carry certain cargo, such as live animals, um, or you know, certain chemical cargoes might not be permitted. They might need to keep within circle cy certain cycle limits or manufacturer tolerances, depending on maybe the jurisdiction in which they, they want to operate and the environmental conditions. Um, they will also need to operate the aircraft without discrimination against other aircraft in their fleet, and that's particularly important where um, aircraft might be on power by the hour arrangements, again, as, as Andrew spoke about. Um, that will be to make sure that the, the lessor gets the rent that it is expecting or, or hoping to receive. Uh, the lessee will also need to provide the lessor with the usual uh, operational indemnity. So they will have to indemnify the lessor for any losses arising from their operation of the aircraft. Uh, these agreed parameters might also include restrictions on further leasing or subleasing by the lessee. Uh, wet leasing will often be permitted subject again to certain parameters, um, usually for, for quite a short period of time. Um, for subleasing, more generally, that might require a lessor consent, um, and that might also uh, need to reflect what the lessor is required to do under their financing, if, if there is financing in place. Um, there will usually also be a restriction on subleasing individual items of equipment or the engines um, that can depend on the creditworthiness of the lessee or the commercial agreement between the parties, a whole range of factors there. Um, a lessee will normally receive uh, what's called acquired enjoyment right um, from the lessor and often from the uh, lessor's other interested parties such as their lender or their security trustee who might have a mortgage over the aircraft. Um, that quiet enjoyment right will usually be switched off if the lessee becomes in default under the lease. Um, that might be able to be remedied, it might not, uh, but that's something there to be aware of. I'm sorry to interrupt that, but so just, just to explain, the quiet enjoyment right essentially says if the, if the lessee of the aircraft has not done anything wrong, then it doesn't matter that it's uh, less or may be in default, for example, under its financing arrangements. If that lessee is in conformity with its lease obligations, then during that currency, it is entitled to continue to enjoy the, the, the quiet enjoyment and use and possession of the aircraft. So in other words, it's a way of ensuring that as a lessee, you are protected if you allow your lessor to, 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 to go and finance the acquisition of the aircraft, you are protected as a lessee from any bad acts, from any events of default on the part of that lessor that may entitle that lessor, uh, that lessor's lenders to exercise their rights against the lessor. Now, that's important. We won't go into this in, in, in too much more detail, but that's important because as a, as a lessee, or indeed as a lender, you might find in those circumstances that you have a defaulting lessor in the middle. And therefore, as a, as a lessee, as an airline, 
you could find in those circumstances that whilst the lenders to your lessor can exercise certain of their security and can effectively assume the role of lessor, you are entitled to keep operating the aircraft as the lessee under the lease. But you potentially have a situation where your lessor has been, let's say, kicked out by its lenders. So that gives rise to some interesting discussions around, around what should happen in that uh, step-in scenario. What should happen if the lenders kick out the, the lessor and are obliged to continue to allow the airline to enjoy that, that quiet enjoyment? Sorry, Ash. Okay, moving on to maintenance repair. Um, as Richard said, the lessee will normally assume responsibility for all of the um, maintenance and repair of the aircraft during the term of the lease. They will also need to action any applicable airworthiness directives that might be issued by, um, by the manufacturer or the relevant authorities and similar service bulletins. Uh, they will need to do so, always, of course, with an eye on the re-delivery conditions that they will need to meet at the end of the lease term. Um, if anything in particular is agreed with the lessor about um, covering the costs of these tasks, um, the lease will set this out in the arrangement similar to what uh, Andrew was speaking about earlier. Um, it might be something like the lessee is required to pay supplemental rent every month alongside the, the basic rent, and that will accrue perhaps in a separate account and then might become available as a lessor maintenance contribution at certain um, time intervals of certain maintenance, maintenance events um, that's subject to commercial agreement between the parties. Um, looking more specifically at engines and parts, um, operationally it's a lot easier for lessees to pool parts and engines within the fleet that they operate whether or not all of those aircraft um, belong to the same lessor. Uh, lessees generally want as much pooling flexibility as possible and lessors prefer them not to do that. And again, they might be restricted by their financing conditions as to what they can agree in this respect. Um, PMA parts, these are parts that might well be approved by the original manufacturers, but are not actually manufactured by the original manufacturer of the aircraft. So someone like Airbus or Boeing or Embraer, various other manufacturers that you will, you will have heard of. The PMA parts are generally not permitted to be installed on a lease aircraft. Um, and if replacement parts are installed, generally title to those replacement parts will then vest with the owner once they are installed on the airframe or the engine. Um, for engines themselves, the situation is slightly different. The title to the engines will stay vested in the owner or the lessor at all times. Um, and if, they, if the lessee is permitted to install those engines on another aircraft, the interest of the of the owner and any financiers will be recognised by um, a third party recognition agreement uh, by the people who will be operating that equipment um, to acknowledge the, the leasing and the ownership in place there. Um, title engines will be required to be returned with the aircraft at re-delivery. Um, that can take a little bit of uh, forward planning by the lessees because they might need to recover those engines from aircraft that are um, operating in various jurisdictions. Uh, pulling apart with other airlines completely is probably not going to be permitted. You might occasionally see that, um, but that's probably um, slightly too much flexibility for the, for the lessors and the financiers there. And then if we move on to insurance, uh, when an aircraft is on lease, the lease will generally require the lessee to obtain and maintain comprehensive aviation insurances. Um, there are market standard forms of endorsement that have been developed, uh, such as the Lloyd's ABN 67B form, for example, um, to provide consistency and certainty as to how any claims uh, will be handled and how the interests of interested parties, the, the lessors, the financiers, the security trustees, and so on, um, will be recognised in the event that a claim needs to be made under those insurances. Um, the rest of this slide is, is fairly self-explanatory. The insurance is there to protect all of those interested parties against loss or damage to an aircraft or engine um, and third party liability claims. Um, that loss can be a total loss where the, the equipment is a, is a complete write-off. Um, that can be different for, for airframes and engines. So often a total loss to an aircraft is the aircraft airframe plus the engines but a total loss of an engine can be dealt with separately. 
the engine may or may not be installed on the aircraft at the time. For example, if, if a bird strike happens to one engine but not the other, um, that's what that is intended to deal with. Um, the insurance proceeds um, agreed between the parties at the, at the leasing stage should be, they're generally going to be um, 110 to 120% of the book value of the aircraft um, for the hull insurance, which is sort of the, the body of the aircraft itself. Um, so that in the event of a total loss, the insurance proceeds will be sufficient to either replace the aircraft or the engine so that that can be replaced and the, and the lease can continue um, or to repay the outstanding financing that might be in place for that aircraft. Um, and then depending on the events giving rise to the claim, the insurers will pay out the agreed value for a total loss or the cost of repair or a partial loss. Uh, so I think I'll hand over to Andrew now to do the transfer section. Thanks, Ash. So um, transferability is quite a key issue, I guess, for airlines and lessors. I mean, there is uh, quite a big secondary market out there for lessors to trade aircraft. And so the transfer provisions now therefore be quite a key element of any negotiation. I guess the starting point is that um, any sort of transfer by the airline itself will uh, almost invariably be prohibited uh, if an airline in during the, the term of the lease no longer has any use for the aircraft they'll either have to go back to the lessor to try and renegotiate the terms or they might have uh, subleasing rights uh, if there is sort of you know, sufficient slack in the market to be able to, to uh, sublease the aircraft. So in terms of, sort of a transfer or restructuring from a lessor's perspective, this can sort of be categorized in sort of four different ways. There might be the imposition of a head lease where the existing lease would remain in place, the lessor transfers title to a new owner and a new head lease is therefore interposed. There's also security assignments to financiers, which is, as Richard touched on, is also quite an important issue where the lessor is assigning by way of security its rights under the lease to its financiers as security for its various financial obligations. Perhaps more critical, critical as part of the secondary market uh, is the absolute transfer to a third party. So this is where one lessor is selling the aircraft to another lessor. Uh, under English law, that would therefore require the lease itself to be novated uh, from that one lessor to the other. Uh, under American law, New York law in particular, I think that they tend to use an assignment and assumption agreement, so that's often quite a, a point of uh, differentiation between the two governing laws. And then finally, which is perhaps more of a recent uh, innovation, is either the, the, uh, the lessor could create a trust, whereby it effectively becomes the beneficiary of that trust, transfers legal title to uh, a bear trustee, which then leases the aircraft back uh, to the airline, or it could be the case that that structure is already implemented and it's a case of then transferring its beneficial interest uh, to a third party. And this is a particular hot topic at the moment because uh, in the past two to three years, there's been this big push by certainly the bigger lessors to introduce um, what is called GATS, uh, which is a general aviation trading system, which is intended to sort of be a, a sort of means of facilitating uh, these sort of transfers between lessors without having to sort of touch the underlying terms of the lease and therefore not bother the airline. <clears throat> Although, I mean, in terms of how that has picked up and uh, experienced to date is I don't think it's particularly taken off, especially uh, given that I think the launch of GATS sort of coincided with the, the crash that resulted from the, the pandemic. So in terms of sort of key conditions and issues that might sort of arise and sort of transfers generally, an airline's key consideration is it doesn't want to be under any increased obligations or suffer any diminished rights. And this particularly relates to sort of any withholding tax exposure that might arise. And as touched upon earlier, there is that gross up obligation. So they don't want to be in a position that if lessor A transfers to lessor B, that they could therefore be required to pay any withholding tax that they don't currently do. <clears throat> so for example, if a lessor in Ireland transferred to a lessor in China um, and say that there was a withholding tax imposed in China, but there isn't in Ireland, the airline would continue to not have to gross up for any withholding tax that might arise. The sort of uh, caveat there is that there's often a, um, 
concern around sort of change of law risk. So any lessor would want to be exposed to uh, any subsequent change of law. And so that it has to be sort of assessed by the time of the transfer itself. So if there were to be a, a subsequent change of law in Ireland that didn't in, in, involve a withholding tax, that the uh, airline would still be required to, to gross up its payments there. Other sort of issues that arise are sort of required enjoyment confirmation from the new lessor or any financier. Um, because there are certain payment obligations that might be incumbent upon the, the lessor, uh, certainly with the return of any security deposit, or perhaps any contributions from the maintenance reserve pots that have been put aside, um, the airline may want to have some sort of confirmation that there is a tangible net worth to that lessor, um, either itself or that it's backed up by a guarantee from a, a more substantive entity. And then because airlines can often be disinterested in the sort of whole transfer process because it effectively is between two other related parties, um, there will often be sort of covenants around cooperating with the process and providing reasonable cooperation in that respect. And increasingly, um, and it may sort of explain why GATS hasn't taken off, there has been sort of an expectation among certain airlines that they might get some sort of fee for their sort of cooperation with the whole transfer process. So I think that sort of takes me on to sort of the, the various additional lease documents which um, Rohan will cover. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so as Richard talked about at the beginning, um, the main lease agreement kind of sits at, sits at the, as an umbrella agreement to, to some of these additional uh, documents which are provided either as some kind of security to the lessor or alternatively as some kind of they have they play each play some kind of administrative role um, so one of those things is is a guarantee and, and usually the lessor will may ask their lessee to, to provide a guarantee it can come in a number of different forms um, the most common ones we see are corporate guarantees where a parent company who sits above uh, the lessee in their sort of corporate structure will guarantee the obligations to, to pay the rent and pay the maintenance reserves and the other um, aspects that Ashley talked about. Um, the alternative to a corporate guarantee is, is a personal guarantee. These are obviously seen a little bit less frequently, but there could be a shareholder or an individual who sits at the top of the corporate structure who may have the financial resources to be able to to guarantee those those financial obligations towards the, the lessor. Um, the second one is a, an assignment of insurances and um, Ashley talked earlier about the obligation for the lessee to maintain comprehensive insurance policies to to guarantee the, the value particularly of, of the hull during the term of, of the lease. Um, what the lessor will want in that scenario is, is for a, a right to be able to go after the insurance proceeds um, and the ability to claim, to claim those back. And, and the, the reason why is because obviously an aircraft generally stores a lot of value um, in the metal itself and in the engines. And so uh the it may be a route to claim their their debt back if if the lessor has an assignment of those insurances um equally in the reinsurances if those insurances are placed back into the market and reinsured um very credit worthy airlines may be able to to resist uh providing that because um with the combination of of a guarantee and there are the financial resources and a big security deposit, they may be able to say that they, they're not obligated to pro provide that. Um, <laughs> the next item is a, is a deregistration power of attorney or an IDERA. The purpose of these documents are effectively to um, facilitate deregistration um, or export of the aircraft. So usually, when you've been at the airport, you may see on the tail markings of, of an aircraft, there are a few, a combination of a few letters and numbers uh, written at the back. The, um, those codes usually can dictate which jurisdiction the, the aircraft is registered in. Um, and 
if there is an event of default which occurs under the lease, the lessor would like to potentially move that aircraft into another jurisdiction or, or um, potentially export it out of where it's being cu currently operated. So as Richard says, that there, there are sometimes demands in the market for aircraft to be in certain locations. Um, and in that scenario, uh, the lessor would want a right to be able to uh, deregister um, or, or move the aircraft quickly and then lease it to, to another lessee who's, who's paying and is credit worthy. Um, the, they're usually recorded with an aviation authority and um, there's, there's questions in certain jurisdictions about whether you provide both a deregistration POA and an IDERA, um, but we, we won't go too far into detail in, into that. Um, the next couple of items are, are sort of more on the administrative side. Um, an air traffic control or an airport's authority letter is basically an information right for the lessor. Um, they can uh, find out if there are any outstanding amounts which are due to either air traffic control agencies or airport authorities. Um, it's not technically a security interest it's, and it's not registrable, but it's effectively giving the, um, giving the, the lessor some comfort into the amounts and sums owed. Um, and the next item, again, is very similar. Euro control letter so is the exact same principle, but it's, it's for aircraft which are operating within European airspace. Um, the final item is, is warranty agreements. Um, during the term of the lease, the lessee would want a right to be able to use the warranties um, over the airframe or over the engines, uh, just in case they need to make a claim um, if there's any damage during the course of the lease. Um, and there are usually prescribed forms for those um, warranty assignments or rights to use the warranties, um, which are either provided by the manufacturer, so Boeing and Airbus, uh, for example, or, or for the engine manufacturers. Um, and each of those manufacturers have a slightly different form. So um, Airbus, for example, does their airframe warranties unilaterally. So it's just they're the only party who signs off on the, on the right for the lessee to use that warranty. Uh, whereas Boeing, for example, uses a tripartite agreement, which is signed between them, the lessor and the lessee. Um, and so all three parties will consent to the right to, and the, the terms on which those warranties can be used. So turning to enforcement, um, I mean, this could actually be the subject of its own topic, to be honest, um, given there's a lot of detail that could be gone into here. So this is just sort of meant to be really an overview, sort of looking at perhaps the sort of contractual framework that really sort of applies here. So as I touched upon earlier, um, a lease would contain a number of events of default, um, which would effectively give certain rights if they're triggered. In terms of, sort of the various categories that are covered, they are very much subject to the bargain of the lessor and the lessee at the time. Um, so that a top tier airline will certainly push back on the number of events of default, which it has to agree to compared to perhaps a, a lesser credit. And there will certainly be sort of like a, uh, a debate as to what extent an airline should take the risk for things outside of its control. Um, so, so for instance, if there's material adverse change or an illegality event or uh, something along those lines. But these uh, items here are, are sort of broadly the categories which you'd expect to see uh, at its core in any sort of uh, event to default section. So, you're looking at uh, perhaps sort of a non-payment of rent by the airline, um, a failure to ma maintain insurances, that's often considered to be quite critical, uh, especially given sort of the potential implications of an uninsured aircraft were it to crash. So that can often be a, what we would call a, a drop dead event of default, so it doesn't really have any grace period to it. There will be sort of a general breach or misrepresentation section, which will pick up any sort of general breaches that have been made under the lease with subject to an agreed grace period. The insolvency of the airline will also be quite a key trigger for any 
uh, event of default, and potentially also cross defaults, which are again themselves very much subject to negotiation. But these may pick up things like a, a cross default with another lease, which is with that lessor or one of its affiliates. It might look to sort of broader financial thresholds. Um, so if, say, there is uh, you know, the case of the lessee and its aggregate has breached 10 million, 20 million dollars worth of debt overall, that might well trigger an event of default. So in terms of the actions that might follow an event of default, the lessor will have a number of remedies, but one of its sort of uh, issues it will have to weigh up is whether it wants to terminate the lease. And there may be market circumstances where there is a lot of uh, excess capacity in the system, especially when there's been a, a global pandemic when an, a lessor doesn't want to necessarily terminate that lease and wants to potentially keep it in situ. And if that is the case, then it would be advisable to at least serve a, a reservation of rights letter to the airline to sort of note that there has been an event of default and the lessor is, is reserving its rights. If it then does come to termination itself, you would look, this is particularly an English law concern, you'd look to the termination of the leasing of the aircraft as opposed to <clears throat> the wholesale lease itself. The rationale behind that is it then preserves uh, indemnities and other obligations which are intended to survive the, the, the redelivery and termination of the lease of the aircraft. The airline itself may be cooperative <clears throat> and may just effectively hand back the keys to the aircraft to the lessor, or there may be a contested repossession, which in itself, as I said earlier, could be the subject of its own discussion, brings with it its own number of considerations, which will depend on the fact pattern at the time. And there, when sort of repossessing, I suppose the, the general comment to note is that local factors and the level of administrative cooperation will be very, very important. Um, there, there is the Cape Town Convention, which I understand you're going to have a talk on later, which is quite uh, integral to aircraft leasing and financing generally. And a lot of sort of lessors and financiers have sort of perhaps taken comfort from the ratification of Cape Town in a certain jurisdiction. But as time has gone on, we have seen that that alone is not necessarily a panacea. It, it is helpful and it is often sort of stick perhaps to beat the local authorities with if they're are any issues, but if you're dealing with a jurisdiction where the state carrier has gone uh, insolvent uh, or is otherwise not complying with its lease obligations, there could be a lot of sort of soft political pressure to sort of keep that airline protected. Um, so there may, it could, I guess, effectively be, be more honored in the breach than in the observance, I guess. Um, and I suppose there have been sort of a number of examples of how Cape Town, uh, where it has been ratified, there have been teething issues over the years. <clears throat> I think we've seen a sort of number of jurisdictions where that's been the case. I think India actually itself was, was one with the Kingfisher insolvency a number of years ago where there was some uncertainty around sort of the ratification uh, and, and recognition of ideas that were registered with the, with the local authority, which sort of stymied the repossession of the aircraft. But I believe that was then actually subsequently resolved. But I would, of course, defer to the Link Legal uh, team on that front. Uh, so I think that sort of brings me to the, the final slide, which is about leasing in a financing context. Right, good. Well, I want to allow enough time for the uh, for the interrogation, so I shall uh, I shall do this slide in uh, double fast speed. Um, but suffice to say, what we've tried to do over the course of this hour is really build up uh, the, the oil painting for you and sort of layer some of the colours onto that picture. And now's really the time to step back and, and, and look at what we've been painting. And whether that's with Andrew talking about events of default or uh, the transferability of leases, uh, whether that's Rohan and his, his discussion around some of those ancillary documents or, 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 or Ash talking about uh, in insurances or um, uh, redelivery concerns. Really, leasing is all about credit risk. And to understand leasing in a finance context, uh, one has to understand where the credit risk is placed, and in particular, uh, the distinction between an operating lease and a finance lease. Now, we could spend uh, another hour or two talking about these sorts of things, but suffice to say, that since 2019, 
uh, a regulation called IFRS 16, but it came into effect from 2019. Essentially, there is no financial distinction drawn between an operating lease and a finance lease anymore. But there is still a legal distinction. And so I'll commend again the uh, very interesting celestial aviation trading case. It's very good for getting into this sort of um, uh, distinction. And fundamentally, the difference between an operating lease and a finance lease is about whether or not the lessor expects at the end of the lease term to take the lease back, uh, to take the aircraft back from the lessee. And if a lessor does not expect to receive the aircraft back, if the lessee is expecting to effectively pay for that aircraft during the lease term, then that is in many ways akin to a, uh, to a financing transaction and uh, will often be accompanied then by a, by a purchase option for the lessee to take the aircraft, which of course means that for a lessor, they are not worried about the condition that the aircraft comes back to them in. Just one um, important point to note there is I think the primary jurisdictions for uh, international aircraft finance transactions, leasing transactions, primary international jurisdictions are probably English law and New York law. And there are some limitations in that regard with, uh, we, 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 we practice in both jurisdictions, so we have no uh, particular axe to grind, but there are some limitations in that regard with New York law where uh, finance leases are at risk of being recharacterized as a secured financing. And that means that if, if the appropriate security filings haven't been made, you, what you thought was a finance lease may in fact be uh, recharacterized, particularly in a bankruptcy, as an unsecured uh, financing. And you would therefore rank alongside unsecured creditors. The only other point I will make to allow sufficient time for uh, questions is just around tax leasing. It's an area where we spend a fair amount of our time. Essentially, most, most leasing transactions will have an SPV, uh, special purpose vehicle lessor. Now, those lessors will sometimes be uh, bankruptcy remote, uh, what we call orphan vehicles, um, and they may sometimes be subsidiaries of a parent lessor. When you have a tax lease, that uh, SPV will be economically transparent, which means that the investors uh, sitting above or behind that SPV are intended to benefit from all of the economics of the transaction, the aircraft um, uh, rental income and potentially ultimately the aircraft sales proceeds, but also importantly, any depreciation that arises because of uh, that aircraft being a capital intensive asset, any, any depreciation and associated tax allowances can, in a transparent lessor, therefore be made available to the investors. And those investors can in turn share the economic benefits with the lessee as a way of incentivizing the lessee to contribute to, uh, to the tax leasing transaction. It comes with certain limitations, Probably the most common that we uh, see in the market are the, the JOL and the JOLCO, which are Japanese operating leases. The distinction really between those two is just where the uh, residual value um, risk really sits. That's a requirement of the Japanese tax uh, legislation um, that the residual value risk sits with the investors. But in the JOLCO structure, there is a predetermined uh, ability for the uh, for the lessee for the airline to acquire the aircraft for a, for a predetermined price. I'm not going to go into any more detail on this at this stage. I think we could probably do a whole another hour on uh, on on finance, lease finance and transactions. So I will pause there and just thank everyone for your uh, kind attention. We're very uh, honoured by the number of participants. So thank you all for for staying with us. And we're uh, very happy to take any questions on uh, on any aspect of the, the presentation or otherwise. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, Ashley, Rohan, and uh, Andrew. Uh, I mean, for tracing out and drawing this picture, and you know, uh, telling us about each and every nuances which go into an aircraft leasing, uh, you know, transaction. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, and first of all, Vanshika Chandra, uh, you know, uh, thanks you for answering, you know, a question about quiet and German rights, uh, which you picked up earlier on. Uh, Mahadev M has asked a question about uh, sale and lease back of aircraft. Uh, he asks, uh, what is meant by buy, sell and lease back of aircrafts? 
when and why do airlines adopt this mechanism for procure procurement of aircrafts? Uh, I think Richard, <laughs> you are well, uh, you know, was to pick this up. You, Thank you, you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's a good question. It's an interesting question. So sale and leasebacks are fundamentally uh, a very, very useful uh, device for an airline where the airline has uh, aircraft on its balance sheet. Those aircraft are capital intensive and it wishes effectively to monetize the aircraft, but still have the use of it. So uh, as an airline, you would sell the aircraft to a lessor and you would then lease it back from the lessor. So as an airline, you no longer own the aircraft. You have the purchase price in exchange for it, useful for your accountants in particular. Uh, but you then have the ongoing obligation to pay rentals. So it frees up some short-term liquidity, uh, and it's a useful device um, for, uh, for better managing a, uh, an airline's capital stack, and for better managing an airline's uh, balance sheet, whilst maintaining the use of their obviously fundamental uh, revenue-generating asset. Right. Now, now, of course, Richard, you also spoke about, you know, complex structures of, you know, NetLease and Hello High Water, you know, you made it a, a sound very simple. Uh, you know, arising from that, uh, you know, one of our attendees, Surbi Gupta, has asked us uh, what modifications or arrangements were arrived at between lessors and lessees uh, in the existing lease agreements due to impact of the pandemic? And what do you think, in your view, is the path ahead? for, you know, relationship between lessees and lessors considering the pandemic? Yeah, very good question. A very topical question. Um, a question that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. So, uh, so thank you for it. Um, I think that ultimately the Hello High Water provisions have been robustly tested by a number of parties and with varying degrees of success, uh, the Hello High Water concept has been found to be sacrosanct. So essentially the risk of, and this is, this is my earlier point about credit risk as well. Essentially, the risk of that asset is with the lessee under an operating lease. And that means that quite literally come hell or high water, come COVID-19 or otherwise, the responsibility for, uh, for the aircraft and for continuing to pay rentals in respect to the aircraft remain uh, in almost all respects with the lessee. Now, that's not to say that lessors haven't become nervous and sort of keenly tuned in to some of the arguments that uh, have been made by and on behalf of airlines. And so we are seeing hell or high water clauses that expressly reference pandemics uh, as a way of making it clear that uh, it really is an absolute provision. It really is sacrosanct in the sense that there is nothing out there that we can imagine that could ever possibly befall um, any of the global aviation uh, uh, community. That would cause a lessee to be uh, to be able to sidestep its obligations under the lease. So you are seeing some fine tuning. There haven't been um, there hasn't been much legal process in terms of circumnavigating the, the hell or high water provision. But but I suspect that um, you know there are remaining good arguments on the part of airlines around the circumstances in which it is. Um, uh, just and equitable to be able to uh, to be able to force an airline to keep paying for aircraft, but certainly under English law and New York law, the the the, the prevailing view has been that the leases in their current form work, and the lessors are just uh, just fine tuning. Yeah, uh, another just just I'll just pass on one another question. Uh, Wanchika asks, can you please explain how termination of leasing? differs from termination of a lease under English law in order to preserve indemnity? Yes, I will let uh, Mr. Harper take that question, seeing as it was on his slide. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a favourite of all of ours, but Andrew, why don't you uh, field that one? Yeah, I mean, it, I appreciate it. It's, it's a particular nuance to it, but I, I, the idea is that you have the lease framework. It has a certain contractual obligations which uh, are set out within it, and there are uh, obligations such as indemnities, they will often be expressed to survive generally. So when it comes to termination and wanting to take the aircraft back, um, it is advisable to say that you are terminating the leasing of the aircraft, uh, thereby effectively terminating the right of the lessee to continue leasing it. But in so doing, you are sort of preserving all of those obligations, such as the indemnities, 
uh, so that they continue to survive. I know that I think New York law can differ slightly. They can sometimes refer to the, sort of the termination of the lease. Um, I think that's a sort of particular element of uh, New York law. And I think they perhaps take the view that all those various obligations continue to survive in any event. Um, and that's just sort of like an example of sort of how American and US and uh, British practice can differ. Right. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks for picking it up. Uh, actually, I think you spoke about uh, delivery, re-delivery, and you know, repossession of an aircraft. Uh, there's a very interesting question asked by Prakti. Uh, she says, are there any restrictions on the ability of a lessor to export the aircraft from the operator's jurisdiction on termination of leasing? Uh, then she asks, what jurisdiction would you say, in your view, is the most suitable for aircraft repossession within developing economies? Well, um, if we're talking about at the end of the lease, I think you mentioned that the, the question was what would happen at the, when, once the lease is terminated. So once the either the lease or the leasing of the aircraft is terminated, then the lessor is, is free to deal with that aircraft as they, as they see fit, you know, according to um, the, the next arrangements that they have in mind for the aircraft, it might need to be moved to another operator and to do that, they might need to move it to another jurisdiction. So once all, all that's terminated, then they can deal with that as they like. Um, in terms of enforcement, that's a hugely complicated. Yes, <laughs> just, just before we get on to enforcement, just, just to mention as well, in, in, in the lease, the return conditions, we usually stipulate, for example, re-delivery to uh, an FAA or EASA approved facility in location X. Now location X may be rather wide, it may be anywhere in Southeast Asia, for example, um, but it will specify the type of facility to which the aircraft must be returned. Um, and so the lessor therefore has control that the lessee will bring the aircraft, uh, assuming it doesn't default, will bring the aircraft to a facility from which the lessor can then export it. Now, if you have a consensual export, it's really quite simple because the, air, the outgoing airline, for want of a better description, will apply for what we call an export certificate of airworthiness, and we'll give that to the lessor, and the lessor can take the aircraft wherever, wherever it needs to go, put it into the shop, uh, put it in for painting, uh, put it into the new livery, and uh, deliver it to a new airline. Obviously, in a non-consensual uh, termination of a lease, then in those circumstances, you're looking to the devices uh, that Rohan was talking about, the ideas and the deregistration powers of attorney. But I think Ash was about to come on to enforcement, and that's fraught with all sorts of then uh, practical issues around how you actually um, extract an aircraft from, from a jurisdiction without the cooperation of, uh, of the person in possession. And I'll let Ash talk to, to any point she wants to make on enforcement, but just to the specific question, which, which is the best jurisdiction to, to repossess in? I, you know, there are, there are many jurisdictions in which we've successfully repossessed aircraft. And I don't think that, that necessarily there is one jurisdiction that is the best. But you're typically looking at a couple of factors. First of all is as um, uh, the, the rule of law generally, that country has has it been robustly tested has aircraft or asset repossession been robustly tested and respected before the courts there previously what is the uh, status of the cape town convention there and uh, is it respected in both legal and practical terms by the authorities ash can talk about some experiences we've had in south africa uh, where they've very much paid lip service to it um, and uh, I think the third factor is purely practical because if you are uh, seeking to re repossess an aircraft, you need appropriate local experience, legal, technical, uh, you need pilots, uh, you need to be able to get the pilots in to remove the aircraft. So there are, there are a myriad of different factors, and I don't think that I would want to say that, that um, you know, one jurisdiction is, is necessarily better than the other. We have extracted aircraft from... Uh, many, many challenging jurisdictions, including, uh, uh, you know, Eastern European jurisdictions where uh, some of the, uh, let's say, some of the rule of law questions around, um, uh, you know, the respect of creditors' rights were perhaps um, uh, still unanswered. And really, it's, it's a question of where is the aircraft at the point in time that the, the, the repossession action is, is, is to take place. Ash, do you want to just mention the um, idea of point? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so it, as, as Richard said, it is a, totally fact dependent on the circumstances at the time. Um, but we, we have had a situation where um, in, in South Africa where, where Cape Town has been ratified and, and officially the, the government agencies um, need to comply with their Cape Town Convention obligations. Um, in practice, the airline that we were dealing with was um, not cooperative and they were very influential with the local aviation authority and we're going to make it very difficult for the aviation authority to actually honor the idea that, um, that the lessor was going to rely on. Um, so even, even where there looks on paper like there's gonna be a clear legal answer to the question, in practice, it might very much depend on um, you know, the political influence of the airline or the political will of the aviation authority or even something like the, the the contacts in the courts of the local council team that you're using. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, so so they, it's they, the aviation authority said, yes, we respect your idea. We're very, very pleased to be a Cape Town contracting state. We respect your idea and we will honour it. We need to get uh, 17 or 18 signatories, of which nine of them are currently laid up with COVID. So, uh, you know, get back to us next Christmas. So um, it doesn't necessarily matter uh, uh, what the legal regime is if, if, uh, if those sorts of dark arts are being deployed. And we see a lot of that around enforcement scenarios.